travel on railways in a way that he hadn't been able to travel before. Before the 1840s, 50s, people tended to go to towns and work there and not leave them. But after the 1850s, 1860s, and railways enticing people to travel on them and running special trip trains, it enabled people to travel where they'd never ever dreamed of travelling before. The Furness Abbey Hotel was promoted as a holiday centre. As early as 1847, a station and hotel had been opened near the Abbey ruins as the line passed directly by the site. The hotel became very well known and was refurbished following a serious fire in 1899. It was able to compete on a national level and boasted in its advertising literature that there was electric lighting throughout, along with 36 bedrooms and three bathrooms. Many tourists stopped at the hotel to admire the Abbey and other railway passengers just dropped in for tea at the railway-owned hotel. It helped to ensure that passenger trade on the Furness Railway increased by 100%. It was mostly demolished after being damaged by bombs in 1941. The Furness Railway became increasingly involved in boat services. At one time, it looked as if Barrow was to become an important port. In 1867, a service started between Peel Pier and Douglas on the Isle of Man. In the same year, a regular service began between Barrow and Ireland. In 1901, the paddle steamer Lady Evelyn ran between Barrow and Fleetwood during the summer. For holidaymakers, it was very popular, as they could come from Blackpool and visit the lakes. She was built mainly so that the railway could diversify into passenger services, as traffic from the iron mines continued to reduce. The Lady Evelyn had a colourful life. She was eventually sold and renamed the Brighton Bell, in the end, becoming a minesweeper. Other paddle steamers, such as the Lady Moira and Lady Margaret, became popular and familiar sights on the Barrow Run. The service became a big attraction, with numbers rising from 28,000 in 1901 to 150,000 in 1914. But overall, the days of the Furness Railway were numbered. Times were changing. In 1923, it was absorbed by the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. It was the end of an era. There have been moves over the years to try to diversify the town's economy. But it is shipbuilding that has led to Barrow being known and respected in many countries of the world. The giant Devonshire Dock Hall dominates the skyline. It was designed so that vessels could be built for the Royal Navy in a specially enclosed building. It stands over the old Devonshire Dock, which was opened in 1867 and was part of the original system. The Devonshire Dock Hall is the largest ever tailor-made building and one of the most modern facilities of its kind in the world. But the history of shipbuilding in Barrow goes back many years. Some of the world's biggest vessels of their time came from Barrow. Liners like the Oriana in the 1950s. Although huge at 42,000 tonnes, it was built for comfort and had a feeling and all the facilities of a first-class hotel. It shows how well constructed and durable it was because it was not strapped at the end of its life as an ocean-going vessel, but instead sold and used as a hotel in Japan. The high cranes over the docks and shipyards have been a familiar part of Barrow's skyline for many decades, but the first shipbuilders were people like William Ashburner, who originally worked in Ulverston, but started a yard in Barrow repairing vessels in 1847. Twenty more ships followed over the years. Others were attracted by Ashburner's success. Joseph Rawlinson opened a repair yard, and when he retired, he sold his limited company to James Fisher, who expanded the business to repair his own ships and build new ones. But things really started to take off in April 1870, with the founding of the Barrow Iron Shipbuilding Company. A yard was equipped for building just iron ships. It was sited on old Barrow Island, and the first vessel was launched in 1873. The shipbuilders were versatile, and in 1881, the city of Rome, a liner, was built for the transatlantic run. At the time, she was the largest vessel ever built next to the Great Eastern and was 550 feet long. In 1899, Barrow's first battleship was completed. She was HMS Vengeance. 
Other naval vessels, mainly gunboats, were also being built. The industry was growing. Shipwrights, platers, boilermakers and welders often worked flat out to make sure the ships were completed on schedule. Barrow was rapidly gaining a reputation as a great shipbuilding town. The yard also started to build submarines. After some early relatively unsuccessful experiments in the 1880s, the whole enterprise started to expand. Different classes of submarines were built, each incorporating more advanced designs and technology. The A-class submarines were first launched in 1902 and were the first to have a conning tower, something which became so familiar on later classes. Barrow has been at the forefront of uh, submarine technology ever since the turn of the century and Barrow will still be at the forefront of submarine building because the technology and the, the knowledge gained in this yard um, is something that uh, you, you would need to go very, very far afield to gain elsewhere in the country. Although other companies have built submarines, Barrow has always inevitably been the, the lead yard. Barrow shipyards have had several owners over the years and in 1888 it was taken over by the Naval Construction Armaments Company which at once began to extend and modernise the works. Within months they had won a contract for three cruisers, which was the first major admiralty order. This was followed by the contract for HMS Powerful, the biggest cruiser in the world. She was launched in July 1895 at what was then called the Barrow Launching Ground. She also incorporated several major innovations in ship design. The big problem with warship contracts was the fact that the yard was not able to deliver complete vessels. This was because the guns, mountings and ammunition all had to be supplied by other firms. But this all changed in 1896 when Vickers Sons and Company bought the Barrow Works for £430,000. A year later there was another amalgamation and the name changed to Vickers Sons and Maxim Limited and this meant that armaments could now be made in Barrow. There was a vast area of workshops which specialised in making military hardware for the world's armies and navies. Everything was produced from brass case shells to enormous guns for fighting ships. The barrels were sometimes so large that they would have to be taken by railway to the firm's specially built gun testing range at Eskmeals in West Cumbria. The building of warships was the company's first priority. Over the next ten years, there was launch after launch on what was becoming almost a production line of vessels. Many orders were completed, including ships for foreign nations such as Japan. There were also contracts for more merchant vessels. But Vickers was not content with the sea. Whether on the surface or under it, the company was also looking to the sky. However, there were certainly mixed fortunes in the early efforts shown in aviation. A huge airship shed was constructed to house this new and exciting fledgling industry. Work on the first naval airship started at Cavendish Dock in 1909. A £28,000 contract was placed with Vickers at Barrow and a joint Royal Navy Vickers team set to work. Officially the airship was called His Majesty's Airship No. 1, but unofficially she was called the Mayfly. It was not until May 1911 that it was taken from the building shed. She emerged stern first from the shed at Cavendish Dock, but was too heavy and went back for modifications. There was a wry joke at the time that she may fly today or she may fly tomorrow. Four months later, on September the 24th, she was brought out again. But disaster struck. A sudden strong wind slammed the airship. Within minutes, there was a loud cracking noise and she broke her back. The huge envelope fractured and the crew in the rear gondola, afraid when they saw the waves rising above them, jumped into the water. Freed of the weight, the rear section of the Mayfly rose into the air and the gondola...